Welcome to Living a Full Life Podcast. Join us as we explore health topics that encourage raising healthy children, living a healthy life, and living the best life possible. Now, here's your host. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another podcast of Living a Full Life. I'm Dr. Enrico Lochicori, and this week's topic is the drug effect. 2024 kicked off with uh, a bang this year as far as getting back to normalcy, superinflation, shrinkflation, and all the things that are hitting us left, right, and center. But one of the biggest topics of 2024 is Ozempic because of its massive 2023 profit earnings. This Danish company that uh, patented Ozempic and Wagovi uh, went up $500 billion and pretty much quadrupled Denmark's GDP overnight. Uh, Pretty amazing stuff, but it just shows the flock that not only Americans, but the Western world has to drugs. We just don't want to take responsibility for anything. And unfortunately, the long-term side effects, which are already being shown, anything over three months is considered long-term, is already being shown. And they're quite alarming on these drugs and what they're doing. There is no magic pill We say this over and over again. My great-grandmother said it. My grandmother said it. My mother said it. It's been passed on for generations, but yet we want to ignore uh, generational and universal intelligence. Uh, We just want to believe that we know better because we are still alive and the dead people are dead. But that's not fair. Uh, What we're seeing is massive side effects. And I'm going to go into the, the big ones, which are making up a majority of the side effects. Forget the nausea and the vomiting. That you can get over with. It's the pancreatitis. It is the gastroparesis. It is the gastric paralysis that we're talking about with patients that are taking this long term. So let's delve into something really important here about weight loss. And since we've talked a couple of episodes about it, I thought maybe we'd talk about the dangers of taking a drug every single day. And this goes across all medications. And as a chiropractor, I get the luxury of working with patients that are on the healthier side of the fence and are looking for wellness and staying well. So the conversations of true sickness and people that are desperately in need of, you know, pain medication or statins or blood pressure medications is not part of my routine every single day because we take care of the healthier side of the population. And we understand that. And because we take care of the healthier side of the population, we now understand what it takes to be well and stay healthy long term. So we have every right to be talking about health and wellness and maybe be lean on sickness and disease because that is also its own struggle. But when we talk about Ozempic, these people aren't necessarily sick. And you're really ticking off the diabetics, by the way, because this is a drug that they could get for a legitimate reason to lower their A1C. And yet everyone else is doing it to look like a waif. The WAIF is back, I guess. Uh, I'm going to omit this one and not take part of this little fad that's going on for sure. Uh, I remember in the 90s as a young kid, that was the look. And uh, yeah, they look sick. I saw a few people in hospice. I'm like, okay, I guess you want to look like somebody living in hospice. That's fine, but that's not for me. I never, ever liked that. Uh, It's just not a natural look to, to look like that. So that's what we're getting here. We're getting lean muscle mass loss. We're getting uh, irregular appetite patterns, irregular eating patterns. It's just not healthy. It's just not healthy to do. Short-term usage of ozempic, semiglutide, trisepatides, these peptide things to help with a short-term weight loss plan actually can fit in a very healthy routine and can be used to your advantage. I think in a, in a short-term plan, it's a great thing. So realistic weight loss goals, realistic terms to those goals and realistic uh, getting off of this stuff. So what people who've been using it have are raving fans within the first two months. They are just like, this stuff actually works. This is crazy. This is amazing. And then about the three month mark is where things start to start to shift. And if people start getting side effects, they're no longer fans. And if they start to see a decrease in weight loss or a stagnant uh, stagnation in their weight loss, they start to get a little concerned as well. It's the people using it longer than that, that start to get and maybe miss the signs of like, well, I haven't had an appetite. I haven't been eating for six weeks, these last six weeks. Of course, the weight's coming off. But then they say things like, I also haven't gone to the bathroom for four weeks. And you're like, wait, four days? They're like, four weeks. 
four days. Oh, no, doc, four weeks. Four weeks. Like, you need to go to the hospital now. Like, that is a major problem. And they go there, and they don't have any compacted bowels or anything serious. They've just got complete paralysis of their digestive tract. They're just, the, the digestive tract is no longer moving food anymore. It's so slow that it actually takes a week for anything to go through. That is craziness. That is absolutely, you're storing toxins, your pancreas gets backed up, your liver gets backed up, everything gets backed up, and you wonder why you get infection maybe of the liver, definitely of the pancreas, and these side effects start coming up. And we're just messing with neurology, and we're telling the brain that we're not hungry. But it sounds magical, doesn't it? But what's the pathway that's required to do that, and what are we doing to block those pathways for appetite and cessation? That's the question. And we really haven't documented it well enough. We just know that that's how these peptide cascades work. This is how these drug cascades work. And we're tr pretty much blocking them just like we will with uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol or something that blocks the pain receptors. That's how we're looking at this. We're blocking receptor sites. And it's good because the results are great. But really, what is the long-term effect when you block it? Well, the brain says, oh, I guess we just don't need to eat anymore. Oh, I guess we just don't need to uh, process food anymore. So it shuts down the gut, which is crazy town stuff, crazy town stuff long term. So what is a good way to utilize this in a healthy way is a short term plan with your medical provider, whether it's your nurse practitioner, your medical doctor, whoever it is that's doing your weight loss program with you is to do blood work at the beginning, see where your numbers are to utilize this and be tested month to month or every 60 days through blood work to make sure that your A1C is coming down, to make sure your blood glucose is coming down, to make sure that your weight is coming down, to make sure that these things are actually moving in the right direction. That is a healthy way to use this and to have set goals. Big, hairy, audacious goals for weight loss are always dangerous because you have this big pie in the sky goal to get to. And it's always, why is it always your college weight or your high school weight? What is up with that? Why do people in their 50s are like, well, when I was in high school, like that was 197 years ago. Why are you talking about high school? Like what is going on? Why do we, why do we go back to high school? And I know the psychology and why we go back to it. It's the best time in our life uh, being a teenager, free of stress, don't have to make any money. It, it was a good time. It, it's the best memories in our life come from high school, college, those years where we become an adult. And I fully agree with that. And I look back at that as well. And but why do we set our weights like that? Our metabolism is nowhere like that. Our lifestyle is nowhere like that. Our stress levels are nowhere like that. And 30 years has gone by. Why are we going back to those types of weights? It makes zero sense. Your goal should be a realistic weight. What size clothing do you want to get back into? What, uh, what's your goal for, you know, five years down the road? Uh, and they should always be health-based. But we make it very superficial and we make it, uh, you know, uh, visual. We make it, oh, I want to look like this. I want to be this size. I want to get rid of the, t uh, the muffin top. I want to get rid of And it's very physical and it's very dysmorphic when we start looking at things like this instead of the health range. So that's why I'm all for working on a short-term health weight goal with your doctor and using these medications to help major markers like A1C, glucose, triglycerides. I mean, these things are important in getting them in a healthy range. So if the drug helps us do that, or if the semi-glutide helps us get there, I am actually a supporter of this with a plan. And the plan is always ends with getting off of this stuff. It cannot be a long-term effect because not only are the side effects, but just think about it. If you have some type of pain, you can't just take Tylenol forever. That can't be the, it can't be the end of the, the game there. And it's still amazing today how many people come in. I'm like, when did this start? They'll give me a time. And they're like, I just take ibuprofen twice a day. Oh, like, you've been doing this for eight months? Like, yeah, I've just been in pain. What am I supposed to do? I'm like, okay, wow. You know, if it's been one week, I get it but eight months in pain taking the, the medication and they get it. And that's what brought them to our office. Like I'm starting to think that I might have a bigger problem. Like you got it. You absolutely got it. And they know that taking ibuprofen for over and over again is going to lead to major side effects or they just know that it's not good for them. So absolutely important to have an end game with this stuff. Otherwise we're going to be trapped into something major that will require prescription drugs forever, like a statin or metformin or insulin or whatever ends up going on with this, it can turn into a chronic permanent disease, which we just don't want. 
But because, so this is more of a warning in 2024, because of these side effects, and now that they're actually being reported and confirmed from usage of Ozempic and Merger, um, yeah, is it Wugovi and these other drugs, that has been confirmed, we can now talk about it. Now the problem is we just don't know the solutions to it. These people with gastroparesis and gastric paralysis, okay, we stopped them on the drug, they are not getting better. That's the problem. What's the permanent effects or how long is it going to take to reverse this stuff? And how, how do you fix it? Do you eat more food when you can't, when you have no gut motility? That doesn't work. So you got these people now getting their hunger back. They can't eat. They're backed up. It sounds like a literal nightmare. So as a loving practitioner, this is just a PSA saying, yes, these drugs do work. Yes, they do get the results a little too quick. A little people lose a lot of weight really quick. And you got to think about it. We all know the basic rules to diet and, and longevity is we have to have a balanced diet. We have to eat you know, a, a well-rounded diet. And then you look at these drugs and the people are like, I just can't eat. <clears throat> I just can't eat. So let's dive into the science a little bit about how this works. Is anyone curious about how it works? It, I, I've got patients who use it and I ask and they're, they're happy. I look at them like, man, you've lost a lot of weight. They're like, yeah, uh, doing Wugovi or I'm doing Ozempic or doing semi-glutide. I'm like, great. Um, when is it over? When, you, when you, what's your goal? Like, oh, I'll do it a little bit longer. I'm like, okay. Any, any side effects? They're like, no, I feel great. They're, they're raving fans about it, but they don't realize that they've completely lost their appetite and they're really not paying attention to their gut motility. So I'll just bring the awareness to them and be like, listen, listen to your gut motility, your bowel movements. Like it's slowed down a little bit, but it's still normal. It's happening every other day. I'm like, that's not horrible. That's actually okay. And as long as it's consistent, you're okay. Uh, so I'll keep an eye out on them. But the long-term thing is the psychological effect. These peptides and compounded drugs that we have, that what they're doing is changing the brain. And if you've listened to any of my podcasts, you're going to see me shaking my head. And when you start messing with the brain and neurology, it's a big hard no every single time. We cannot do this stuff long term. It's like, hey, doc, you know, you know, shrooms are awesome. Um, I feel good on them. Got some awesome dreams. Great, man. Um, I'm going to do them all the time. I, as a doctor, I'll be like, I, I really don't advise you do that. And they're like, no, it's, I feel good. It's good. I like the dreams. I like dreams. Are you purple today, Dr. D? No, I'm not purple, dude. Are you doing shrooms? Yeah, I'm doing shrooms. So you can't, you know, you wouldn't do that every single day. It would be expensive, one. And two, I mean, you just physically wouldn't be able to handle that. Or maybe you would. I don't know. Maybe you're part of the Beatles. I have no clue. But maybe you could do that. But longevity on that and doing that consistently makes zero sense. You're, you're altering your brain. And this is before my generation. This is Gen X and maybe some of the boomers with acid. And what it does, permanent, permanent damage, and we can go through all the drugs, um, even, even the fentanyl ep epidemic that we have right now, and what it, it, it literally kills people. I mean, that's the first side effect of fentanyl is uh, it will kill them. So we know that altering the brain with any type of chemistry is always a bad decision, always a bad decision. It never works out well. And for people who seriously need help with neurological conditions, whether it's depression, anxiety, ALS, MS, whatever it may be, those drugs are now, you know, part of the game. They need them to help with daily living, to help them with maybe some longevity, but more importantly, quality of life. What we're talking about with the rest of us who don't have to suffer from those things is messing with your brain is always a big no. Always a big no. You're you're disrupting the central nervous system that controls every single thing your body does. And when we do that, it's a problem. So when we get back to these drugs and Ozempic and all these other things, is that when we alter the brain's chemistry and how it perceives appetite and gut motility, and it also transcends across just appetite and food, it transcends against will. What another side effect people are getting is they just don't care. They're like walking around like, meh, I'm not interested in food. So they understand the food component, but then you're like, hey, you want to go watch a movie or you want to go play tennis? And they're like, mm, I, I don't know. They're losing their will and they really don't realize it. And the ones that are conscious are like, yeah, I'm not as excited about anything really. And that's what's happening with the brain. It's really, it's it's fighting for receptor sites. It's it's competing with receptor sites. It's winning. That's what semaglutide does is it wins on these sites on the and it decreases not just appetite, it decreases your willingness to do anything. 
So you got to think about this. How long are you willing to be, you know, almost in a, in a paralysis or almost in a zombie like state just for the sake of weight loss? So you lose your will a little bit. You lose your ambition a little bit. Those are side effects that are also coming up with these drugs. Uh, what other thing? Allergic reactions, vision, vision issues, um, stomach pain. I mean, those are those are the normal, the normal things. But really, Ozempic was first created a long time ago. It's actually been around a while. It um, it was used for diabetics for to help diabetics lower their A one C or maybe pre diabetics avoiding a diabetic diagnosis and the drug works. I mean, if you decrease people's appetite and they don't eat sugar and they don't increase their blood sugar or glucose levels, then you're going to suppress the chances of getting into a diabetic state, which is actually a good thing. But at what cost? Does that make sense? There you go. That was my PSA on Ozempic. I mean, uh, can't ignore it. We can't, we can't sit here and, and, uh, and look at it and be like, it's this magical drug. It really isn't. There is no magic pill. I'm going to repeat. I'm going to be the old guy with my, hopefully my kids have kids with, with my grandkids be like, there's no magic pill. There's nothing out there. That's magical. That's a magic pill there, you know, it health comes from the inside out. It comes from above down inside out, not outside in. You can never find anything from the outside and put it in your body to make you healthier, except whole foods. That's really it. And whole foods don't make you healthier. Food doesn't make you healthier. Food nourishes your body's innate ability to be healthy. It nourishes that process. So there really is not, you're never going to convince me any other way. There's no debate. I've never been to one. I've seen some of the smartest speakers in the world, some of the biggest PhDs in the world talk, and they kind of side with the whole natural thing saying, yeah, there really is no external force on health. It's really flourishing the inside being and making sure it blossoms with good nutrition, clean water, good sleep, all the stuff that helps nourish it. Just if you've ever grown a garden, you pretty much know how to nourish a living organism. That's what you need to do with yourself as well. So there is no magic pill for anything. Once we start to need to rely on pills, it's because something is failing and uh, we've negated it for a while or just bad circumstances that happen. Um, bad timing, and then we need some help. And that's okay. That's what medicine's all about. But for the bigger run, this thing is going to crash and burn. So if you've got stock in it, way to go. Great, great stock uh, stock buy in 2023, but sell. <laughs> it's time to sell. Make your profits and run because just like Moderna and the vaccines in 2020, I mean, the stock went up and then it crashed, right? Because the utilization rate went way down. And the reason why the utilization rate of Ozempic is going to go way down, it might not be 2024, it might be 2025, start to crash and burn is because of the mass side effects coming up and the massive lawsuits that will come in, just like we had with the opioid crisis. That took 10, 12 years to get to that point to, to crash and burn them a little bit. It will not take that long with these drugs because People are going to have a massive side of it. And then the weight gain all comes back. So you're going to have a bunch of angry weight people who tried to lose weight getting together in class action lawsuits to because they're upset. So that that's the trajectory of this drug. Um, but short term, short term with a good doctor and a good nurse practitioner, I think they are fantastic tools to help people reach their goals short term. If you have you know under 100 pounds to lose, this might be uh, something you may want to look at to do that. If you have b bigger weight loss goals, uh, then you're going to be on this drug for a very long time. And then you're risking, you're risking the side effects, right? A pound a week of fat or, or weight loss is aggressive weight loss. So for those people who like, I lost 10 pounds last month, I'm like, wow, that, that was really aggressive weight loss. So we got to make sure it's supervised and done well. Okay, done. Going to cut this podcast off. Just a little PSA. It's been it's been very popular. It's been the number one question, and uh, I'm just seeing a lot more people using it. And I've been surprised at who's been using it. Like the people you didn't think were going to use it, patients of mine or whoever I cross, I'm like, I'm on it. I'm like, wow, really? What made you make that decision? And of course, you don't ask that question. You just like, great, move on. What? Well, stay in my lane. Let me help you with your back and your neck, and we keep moving forward. So that's how that goes. Take care. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Living a Full Life Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.